From Microbe TV, this is Infectious Disease Pusscast, Episode 6, recorded on July 7th, actually, 2022. I'm Daniel Griffin, and joining me today is Sarah Dong. Hi, everyone. I'm back. <laughs> Welcome to another Puscast. You were missed. References, as always, are available in our show notes at microbe.tv, the home of our growing multimedia empire. Infectious Disease Puscast is a review of the ID literature from the last two weeks that we found interesting or entertaining. Now, on to the literature, shall we? All right. I will put this right up front. Um, as so far, we are not sure what category this falls under, or even if it is an infectious disease issue. The MMWR early release, interim analysis of acute hepatitis of unknown etiology in children aged less than 10 years, United States, October 2021 through June 2022. This is an update on what is happening. Clinicians and health departments began retrospectively and prospectively identifying uh, PUIs, um, persons under investigation, on April 2021, 2022. A PUI was defined as a person aged less than 10 with an elevated greater than 500 um, AST or ALT, an unknown etiology for the hepatitis, an onset on or after October 1st, 2021. As of June 15th, 2022, a total of 296 PUIs were reported from 42 U.S. jurisdiction. Among all reported PUIs, 89.9% required hospitalization, 6.1% required a liver transplant, and 3.7% died. Um, people under investigations, PUIs with adenovirus test results from any specimen type, 49.5% received a positive test result. Uh, typing was attempted for 13 specimens, six of which were species F, that's type 41. One was species C, type C1, six could not be typed. Um, overall, 79.7% of the PUIs with available chart data received testing for SARS-CoV-2 infection. 10.2% received a positive test result. History of SARS-CoV-2 infection based on documentation in the medical chart, antibody testing, or parental report was reported for, I'm going to say, only 26.0% of patients. The median interval from prior SARS-CoV-2 infection to hepatitis diagnosis was 133 days. 4.1% um, of patients had received at one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. Other commonly detectable pathogens included rhinovirus, enterovirus, 24.5%, acute EBV virus, 11.4%, rotavirus, 14%, adeno and SARS-CoV-2 were co-detected in 3.5%. Oh my gosh, you can have two things at the same time. A few very important comments. No etiology is identified in nearly one-third of children with acute liver failure. As for the CDC, current U.S. data do not suggest an increase in pediatric hepatitis of unknown etiology or percent positivity for adenovirus types 40 and 41 over baseline levels. So are we actually investigating an outbreak or just finally investigating an ongoing and important issue? All right. Now, as we move into what is a viral, I want everyone to continue listening to the TWIV COVID clinical updates. Uh, perhaps they will become monkeypox weekly updates. <laughs> we have a CDC monkeypox tracker. We'll leave a link in our notes. Uh, but I did want to get some attention to the article Monkeypox, a contemporary review for healthcare professionals published in open forum infectious disease. It's a must read and it is open access. For starters, the basic virology, so we can all sound smarter than we actually are. The Pox viridae family are double-stranded DNA viruses, which infect a range of animals, including birds, reptiles, insects, and mammals. The family consists of two subfamilies, Cordopox renae, with 18 genera and 15 species, and enter Entomopox Verinae with four genera and 30 species. Monkeypox belongs to the Pox viridae family. The Cordopox 
Viridae subfamily and the genus Orthopox viridae. So now when you get the results back that your testing was positive for Orthopox, you can say yes, as I suspected, another case of the monkeypox. Um, to date, we have 11 of these causing human disease. This then becomes a cool bit of trivia at bars for nerdy infectious disease types. Who can name those 11? Well, we have variola, smallpox, cowpox, vaccinia, molestum contagiosum, orf virus, cowpox, yaba monkey, tumor virus, tanapox virus, pseudocowpox virus, bovine papular stomatitis virus, and the monkey pox. Here it gets even better. The authors point out that in the current 2022, we are seeing the macular, the vesicular, the pustular rash, but often with lesions in different stages of development and with mild or absent prodrome symptoms. So maybe we should start teaching how monkeypox actually presents, not how it once we think may be presented. And the correspondence in the Lancet Infection Disease, a prototype lateral flow assay for detection of orthopox viruses. The title says it all, rapid home antigen tests for the monkeypox. Won't that be great? <laughs> I have a quick little nugget. In MMWR, there was updated U.S. Public Health Service guideline for testing of transplant candidates aged less than 12 years for infection with HIV, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C virus. Um, so this amended the 2020 guideline and recommends that candidates under 12 years of age at the time of transplant who did receive postnatal ID testing are exempt from pre-transplant HIV, hep B, and hep C testing during the hospital admission for their transplant, um, with the idea that hopefully we're limiting some blood loss in a pretty uh, low-risk population. Uh, Post-transplant testing, though, is unchanged, so all transplant recipients should still have testing for HIV, Hep B, and Hep C at four to six weeks post-transplant, uh, regardless of age. All right, we do have updated recommendations um, from the CDC for flu vaccines. And let me quote, this is actually the ACIP. ACIP recommends that adults aged greater than equal 65 years should receive one of the following higher dose or adjuvanted influenza vaccines if available, quadrivalent high dose inactivated influenza vaccine, quadrivalent recombinant influenza vaccine, or quadrivalent adjuvanted inactivated influenza vaccine. Shall I translate this into common speak? <laughs> For those 65 and over, the recommendation is not to use that standard low-dose attenuated unadjuvanted inactivated flu vaccines, but instead to get either the flu zone high-dose quadrivalent, is a vaccine prepared from influenza virus propagated in embryonated chicken eggs, and you just get a bigger dose you can get Fluad quadrivalent. This is a vaccine that is adjuvanted, um, also prepared in embryonic chicken eggs, but they can put the adjuvant in there. Or flu block, the recombinant vaccine that involves no virus, no eggs, and thus no egg attenuation. Now, a bunch of us were disappointed that they did not include in this list the flu cell vax, the cell-derived candidate vaccine um, that's propagated in the the Madden Darby Canine Kidney Cells were also a little thrown by timing. This is like when the waiter comes over and after you order and after the things are put in the kitchen, then they go around and tell you the specials. We all make our plans in February, by the way, for our vaccine buying for the fall. So ACIP, I know you guys are vaccine experts. <laughs> All right. In CID, I have a paper called Shared Decision-Making Concerning Anal Cancer Screening in Persons with HIV. Uh, so the ANCHOR study, which is an abbreviation of Anal Cancer HSIL Outcomes Research, uh, was presented at CROI this February, which showed benefit of treating high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesions, HSIL, in persons with HIV to reduce the risk of progression to invasive anal cancer. Uh, but I think the decisions on the best way to actually screen our patients is not a clear consensus among those of us taking care of patients. Um, so this paper included a retrospective cohort analysis of persons with HIV at uh, University of California, San Diego, and found that the first time 
unadjusted prevalence of cytology with HSIL in this longitudinal cohort was 12%. Um, so the, pay, the authors present their, really their shared decision-making framework and a risk prediction nomogram for anal cancer screening in these patients that hopefully you can use um, for those who are clinicians as you're thinking about this and talking about it with your patients. All right, and I am going to move us over to the bacterial section. In JAMA Network Open, there was a paper entitled Effect of Automated Telephone Infectious Disease Consultations to Non-Academic Hospitals on 30-Day Mortality Among Patients with Staph aureus Bacteremia, the Support Cluster Randomized Clinical Trial. So this was a cluster RCT of unsolicited telephone ID consults for staph aureus bacteremia in community hospitals without ID services in Germany. And it showed that there was no impact on mortality, recurrence of infection, or hospital readmissions, although there were some improvements in ID quality metrics like getting an echo or length of treatment. Um, I had actually bookmarked this paper, but also got an email from Dr. David Sroda, who's in Miami, because gasp, here is a paper that doesn't show an improvement in outcomes following ID consult, which is really not what we've been seeing in all these other retrospective cohort studies showing improvement in outcomes uh, when you get us ID docs on board. That said, I think you have to take all of these studies with a grain of salt, not because, I have to say this again, not because I don't wholeheartedly believe that ID docs are the best and improve care, but because many of these studies are probably a little biased and may overestimate the impact of ID consult. Um, and so I have to agree with something that David sent in his email, and I think this will be my best attempt to channel Mark Chrislip is... Isn't it a little bit disheartening and maybe even demoralizing that we in ID seem to have to study our own efficacy to prove our worth? Uh, other specialties don't seem to have to do that. <laughs> but um, I guess the other side of that is maybe we should also be careful studying this topic in case we find results that we don't want to know. <laughs> Um, but just a rundown of some of the downsides of the paper. One, it's only telephone ID consults. So certainly there's something magical about us being in there in person to ask questions and get that social history. Uh, two, there was a median of five days between blood cultures and the phone consult. And so there were about 60 screen patients who died before they could be uh, included, which corresponded to about 9% of the non-included patients. So you could argue that earlier intervention may have been helpful in some of these patients. Um, and many of us in the hospital are probably getting on board with gram positive bacteremia before we actually know that it's staph aureus. Um, and then the last sort of point is that all the sites were randomized to both an intervention and a control period or the reverse order. So I think you'd probably expect that those who had the intervention first probably had some bleed over into the control period. If you have to talk to an ID doctor on the phone for however long about every staph RS bacteremia case, you probably will be better at managing it in the control period afterwards, even if you have a consult, um, no consult. So a little bit of a carryover effect. And then the other piece of this is the Hawthorne effect, which is when you behave a little bit differently when you know that you're being watched. So I love um. ID docs, but just a nice <laughs> uh, contrast to what we usually talk about. <laughs> I, I was wondering if it was also the unsolicited, hello, this is Dr. <laughs> I know you didn't call a consult, but I'm calling you anyway. <laughs> and then you tell them what to do. Like, well, I'm not doing that. <laughs> yeah. um, perhaps people are noticing a theme with this next paper, the article Prevalence and Predictors of Pseudomonas aeruginosa Among Hospitalized Patients with Diabetic Foot Infection was published in Open Form Infectious Disease. At some point in time, everyone started putting every single patient with diabetes and a foot infection on anti-pseudomonal antibiotics. So these are the results from a multi-set or retrospective cohort of hospitalized patients with diabetic foot infections from 2013 to 2020. This included almost 300 patients from five centers. As far as isolated organisms in the study, the most commonly isolated organisms were um, M. SSA, methicillin susceptible staph aureus, 35%, streptococci, 32%, 54 of the cultures were polymicrobial, less than 10% had pseudomonas aeruginosis, yet 257, 88% of patients received empiric antibiotics active against pseudomonas 
aeruginosa. I am just doing my math, and it is easy here as I conclude based on this data that anti pseudomonal antibiotics were only required, what, 9% of the time? So maybe, and I'm going to go out on a limb here, we should consider something like ceftraxone for those diabetic foot infections that require hospitalization, and then maybe only MRSA coverage if the PCR is positive or cultures detect MRSA, and maybe only extending to pseudomonas, anti pseudomonal antibiotics if there actually is pseudomonas. I couldn't decide if you planned the going out on a limb pun or not. (laughs) Um, For our next paper, this is from OFID, High Yield of Blood Cultures in the Etiologic Diagnosis of Cellulitis, Erysipelas, and Cutaneous Abscess in Elderly Patients. Um, So this was published and recommended two sets of routine blood cultures for, quote, precise diagnosis and appropriate treatment of cellulitis in elderly adults, especially patients with shaking chills or leukocytosis. Uh, So this was a single hospital observational study from Japan. They enrolled about 220 patients with, as the title mentioned, cellulitis, erysipelas, or abscess, and there was a median age of about 77 years. So the proportion of bacteremia found in all of these patients was 21% for the total group. 8.5% of patients who were under 65 had bacteremia, and then 25% had bacteremia in patients who were over 65. Um, And they also found that severe infection, shaking chills, and then a white count over 13,000 were independent risk factors for bacteremia. Um, I will say that I do think of and ask for blood cultures if you have a patient who has a convincing story for rigors or shaking chills, and if that white count is just really high and it doesn't seem to fit. But I'm, you know, I'm not sure that we need blood cultures in everyone and maybe even those who are older. Um, So I'm not sure this tells me a ton of new things that would change what I do, although it makes me feel a little bit better about when I ask for uh, blood cultures. The things that I thought were really interesting is um, it, you know, talks about Japan as a super aging society. And um, the other thing that was interesting is that 70% of the patients in the study had tinea pedis. So um, I guess a lot of these patients were living in Okinawa and they pointed out in the discussion that they wear sandals and have a lot of lower extremity injuries. Um, So I just thought this was a nice reminder that if you have patients who have lower extremity cellulitis, particularly recurrent cellulitis, to remember to look between their toes. Um, So not totally related to the paper, but I think a good pearl to remember. All right. The article, The Impact of Universal Glove and Gown Use on C. diff acquisition, a cluster randomized trial was published in CID. Here, the authors studied a total of 21,845 patients um, who had both admission and discharge perianal swabs cultured for toxigenic C. diff and reported that glove and gown use for all patient contact in medical and surgical ICUs did not result in a reduction in the acquisition of C. diff compared with usual care. Wow. (laughs) <laughs> um, this next one, I'll be pretty quick, is in CID, beta-lactam antibiotic therapeutic drug monitoring and critically ill patients, a systematic review and meta-analysis. Um, and so this took a look at, I'm going to say TDM for therapeutic drug monitoring. Um, so the dosing and the clinical outcomes such as mortality, clinical and microbiologic cure, among other things, in patients who are critically ill with sepsis. And they found no association with mortality or um, length of stay, although the guided dosing did seem to have improved clinical and microbiologic cure. You know, I think the evidence showing clearly improved outcomes with the use of beta-lactam, TDM, and sort of who are the right patients to use it in, all of this I think we still need to figure out and clarify, uh, but something that I think we can hopefully learn more about in the coming, I'm guessing, years. Um, And so my next paper, I was excited about this one. This one's from JPIDS. It's called Utility of Induced Sputum in Assessing Bacterial Etiology for Community Acquired Pneumonia and Hospitalized Children. Um, And so this one looked at a couple questions that come up when we think about pneumonia in hospitalized kiddos. And we often use expectorated sputum in adults, which most adults can produce what we consider a, quote, high-quality specimen about half the time, meaning over 25 white blood cells and less than 10 epithelial cells per high-powered field on the gram stain. But not surprisingly, 
if you anyone knows any children, it's very difficult to get a sputum. And we would really love to know whether or not trying something like induced sputum would be helpful for us to understand what's going on in the lower respiratory tract of these children. Um, Because it's not really clear, one, if they can use the adult criteria that we're mentioning for high quality sputum samples, but also whether or not the cultures are as useful in kids who are commonly colonized with cat pathogens. And so the study looked at children enrolled in the EPIC study, Etiology of Pneumonia in the Community. The median age of children who provided an induced sputum sample was 26 months of age. So about half these patients were under two years old. And so there's a couple questions. The first one is, can children hospitalized with CAP produce a high-quality induced sputum sample? Well, getting induced sputum was feasible because 94% had a sample, which honestly was more than I was expecting because this was actually an optional part of that study. But children are definitely less likely to meet this high-quality standard that we see in adults. So only about 19% had that uh, cut off of 25 white blood cells, less than 10 epithelial cells that I mentioned just a minute ago. And so the next question, if we have the induced sputum, how good is the pathogen yield in children? And although the high quality induced sputum samples isolated more pathogenic bacteria than the lower quality samples, 64 versus 44%, the utility of detecting those organisms was really low and didn't really correlate with the sterile site specimens or radiographic changes. And the last question that we always want to know is whether or not it changes outcomes if we treat what we find. And I think the answer is not really. The results were often not timely enough to inform management. And it didn't seem convincing that when we had results, it really reliably figured out the CAP etiology. So I think regardless of the quality, it seemed like the induced sputum didn't really help us. So not really something to fold into our usual practice at this point. All right. I guess my mom was right. You know, my brothers and I would always practice should we end up in the hospital and need to produce a high quality sputum sample. <laughs> wasted, wasted time. All right. The article Epidemiology of Complicated Urinary Tract Infections Due to Enterobacteriales Among Adult Patients Presenting in Emergency Departments Across the United States was published in Open Forum Infectious Disease. In this multi center study of adult patients who presented the, to the ED with UTIs, high rates of resistance and co-resistance to commonly used oral antibiotics, those fluoroquinolones, that trimethoprim sulfa, nitrofrantoin, and third-generation cephalosporins was observed. So not encouraging. <laughs> All right. In OFID, a cross-sectional analysis of linazolid in combination with methadone or buprenorphine as a cause of serotonin toxicity. Um, so this is a retrospective cross-sectional study of adults who received these combinations, so linazolid with methadone or buprenorphine, and there were about 500 encounters. About 100 of those had a duration of concurrent administration of those medications of three or more days, and they found two cases of possible serotonin toxicity and zero cases of def uh, definite serotonin toxicity. You know, we worry a lot about serotonin syndrome with linazolid, but it doesn't seem to happen a lot. And I feel like many are feeling more comfortable with using SSRIs and linazolid, but medications for opioid use disorder have been more challenging. I think my main pause was that the durations of both the linazolid with methadone or buprenorphine in the paper were pretty short and probably shorter than what we would use for a typical treatment course, but at least we have a little bit more data and a suggestion that the incidence is low even with these medications. Um, and so maybe this can help you rationalize and weigh risk benefits when you're kind of stuck in a case where linazolid really feels like it's the best option, um, that maybe you have a little bit more leeway than we originally thought. All right, we have a couple of fungal papers today. Uh, the first one I'll mention is from OFID, Management of Histoplasmosis by ID Physicians, which took a look at results from a survey on management practices for histoplasmosis sent to adult ID physicians on the IDSA's Emerging Infections Network, EIN. Um, the response rate was about 37%, with only 46% of respondents reporting seeing patients with histoplasmosis. So 82% of docs in endemic regions reported seeing patients compared to about 27% of those who were considered, I'm going to say, not classically 
endemic locations because it feels like histo is everywhere. Um, and the sum of it is that most people are using the IDSA treatment guidelines, at least by the survey answers, um, such as itraconazole for acute pulmonary disease, mild to moderate disseminated, and step-down therapy for disseminated disease. But the guidelines are 15 years old. Um, so hopefully, there, I think this was sort of getting a sense of how the new guidelines could be helpful. And one of the keys here was that there seemed to be thought that it'd be really helpful to have a better sense of how to think about and treat histoplasmosis in immunocompromised patients, where we don't really have guidance or a consensus. Um, so sort of uh, searching for things that we can hopefully get a little bit more help with in the newer guidelines. All right. The article, Increased Death from Fungal Infections During the COVID-19 Pandemic National Vital Statistics System, United States, January 2020 through December 2021, was published in CID. Here, the researchers analyzed U.S. National Vital Statistics System data to characterize disease burden, temporal trends, and demographic characteristics of persons dying from fungal infections during the COVID-19 pandemic. They found that fungal deaths increased from 4,833 in 2019 to 7,199 in 2020. And of all the fungal deaths during 2020 through 2021, 21.9% were COVID-19 associated. And the COVID-19 associated fungal deaths involved Canada, 27.1% of the time, and aspergillus, 23.3%. So we're seeing a lot more fungal deaths, so we got to get a lot more fungal articles, I'm hoping. <laughs> All right. My next couple are rapid fire. The first one is in JAC, antimicrobial resistance, clinical utility of antifungal susceptibility testing. Um, so this is just a really is a nice overview that looks at the strengths and limitations of resistance data for pathogenic yeast and molds um, and what we can use to guide treatment and hopefully think about outcomes for our patients, which is a really tricky topic. Uh, so they work through various fungi and give some sort of baseline information. But I think uh, a nice review for a space where often there isn't a correlation between susceptibility and resistance and actual patient treatment outcomes. Um, so a good resource to bookmark and refer to later. Uh, my next one is, I'm probably going to mispronounce this journal, in Mycopathologia? A spotlight on sporothrix and sporotrichosis. Uh, there was a nice, very short, super quick read profile on sporothrix, um, including a nice uh, overview graphic, which is figure one. So I just thought it was a good reminder that we often think of sporotrichosis, at least in, I think, the states as the classical route of transmission is through cutaneous trauma. That rose gardener who gets that rash that creeps up their arm. Um, but it's important to remember that there are Alternative ways, such as horizontal transmission with cat bites and scratches, which is particularly prevalent in South America. All right. And my last rapid fire for the fungal is there were new WHO guidelines for diagnosing, preventing, and managing cryptococcal disease among adults, adolescents, and children living with HIV. Um, so they strongly recommend single high-dose liposomal amphotericin B with 14 days of flucytosine and fluconazole as part of the preferred induction regimen for treatment of cryptococcal meningitis in persons living with HIV. Um, so we'll see if the ambition trial also impacts future HIV guidance from, example, the IDSA. Um, so just a quick follow-up, actually. I don't remember if that was our first episode, but it was, it was one of the earlier ones. All right. And parasitic, I'm going to wrap us up with the article, Dracunculiasis Eradication, End-State Challenges, was published in the American Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. And this report summarizes the status of the global dracunculiasis eradication program as of the end of 20. 21. Guinea worm disease has been eliminated from 17 of 21 countries where it was endemic in 1986, with an estimated 3.5 million cases occurring worldwide. Only Chad, Ethiopia, Mali, and South Sudan reported cases in humans in 2021. Chad, Ethiopia, and Mali also reported indigenous infections of animals, mostly domestic dogs, with Dracunculus metanensis. Insecurity and infections in animals are the main obstacles remaining to interrupting trachunculiasis transmission completely. Hmm. 
All right. And I think that brings us to the end of this PUSCast. As always, the references for this show are available at microbe.tv, the home of our growing multimedia empire. You can find the Infectious Disease PUSCast at Apple Podcasts, microbe.tv forward slash puscast we love to get your questions comments and paper suggestions just send them to puscast at microbe.tv and consider supporting the science shows of microbe tv at microbe.tv forward slash contribute i'm sarah dong you can find me on twitter at s win dong at febrile podcast or at febrilepodcast.com and I'm Daniel Griffin, and you can find me at ParasitesWithoutBorders.com, on Twitter, at Daniel Griffin MD, as well as on the other podcasts, This Week in Parasitism and This Week in Virology COVID Clinical Updates. Thanks for listening. We'll be back in two weeks. Another, Another PUSCast, Puscast is, is infectious. infectious.